The 21st century in Baltimore may be like this. The city sealed inside a dome, pollution-free, the climate controlled. But the experts don't foresee it that way. I think I've been hearing about that for 50 years, and I haven't seen it happen. And I have my real doubts about it's happening. Baltimore has grown rapidly, but what kind of buildings will be conjured up by tomorrow's planners? Will they be similar to those going up today, or more futuristic, such as the new state office building in Chicago? Welcome to the first building of the 21st century. I think it's the ugliest building I've ever seen. None of the new buildings going up in Baltimore will look anything like that one in Chicago. Architects point out that just as the great cities of Europe have changed very little over many, many centuries, they say that Baltimore's skyline, now that it has an established look and style, is unlikely to change very much in the next century. But no one in the original Baltimore of 1730 thought its skyline would change much either because it was surrounded by hills and marshes. However, by the 19th century, the marshland was filled in and covered by thousands of buildings. On the hills were the Washington Monument and churches that would dominate the skyline for the next two centuries. The Great Fire of 1904 speeded up the long overdue restoration of Baltimore's deteriorating downtown. But the rebuilt skyline didn't look very different than before. And it was only in recent years that the area changed dramatically. In the 21st century, there may be a wall of skyscrapers surrounding the inner harbor. Uh, I see more uh, high-rise buildings being built in this city. With 70 and 80-story office buildings in our future. Which uh, can be a curse as well as a blessing. Uh, because high-rise buildings will obscure views and cast shadows and I also think there's going to be a uh, great increase in housing downtown high-rise housing and some high-rise housing is already going up but most of the new housing downtown is actually old housing that's been renovated and it's expected to continue so that much of Baltimore's housing in the 21st century will look like housing in the 19th century I think that's true and I think and of course the development of residential communities in downtown Baltimore or the development of the center of the city as a, as a community. And that's bound to have an effect on the development, on retail developments and on service developments in the center of the city. And the former shopping mecca around Howard and Lexington Streets is already being restored. In 1912, the Jones Falls was covered over, but some architects are predicting that in the 21st century, the Jones Falls will be opened up again for new waterfront development. Well, opening up the Jones Falls means destroying the Fallsway. I think it unlikely. Yeah. And at the RTKL architectural firm, which built the Hyatt Regency Hotel and the new Inner Harbor office building, RTKL President Harold Adams also expressed doubts about housing along the Fallsway, but said the space under the Jones Falls Expressway may be used for commercial development and more parking in the future. The Bethlehem shipyard across the harbor is expected to be converted to waterfront housing and possibly office buildings. About the only waterfront housing in Baltimore now is the townhouse development on Boston Street in Fells Point, but much more is planned in that area. You'll be able to walk, I'm convinced, from the Inner Harbor all the way over to Fells Point. And the walkways may eventually extend to the Canton area, which is expected to undergo similar redevelopment along its shoreline. Mayor Schaefer even wants a beach there. So Baltimore in the 21st century will be a combination of the old and new, but just how new, no one really knows. <laughs> Tomorrow at 6, a look at how Baltimoreans will travel in the next century and how far. I'm Jack Bowden, you've seen too. Downtown Baltimore on a Friday night, alive with action. Thousands pass through on their way to and from work, or to shop, or to be entertained. We pass through the streets, but when we see them, we probably turn our heads the other way. Away from those faces that seem to carry the weight of a lifetime of hard knocks. We turn away, but if we were to stop, we would find that behind the faces, there are stories of lives past. I was in uh, World War II, right? I'm 68 years old. I get a pension myself. I live right over there, 8 uh, North Gay Street. And that uh, flop house, what's called a flop house. I call it the flop house. Should be something done about that place. 
At least that man has a roof over his head most nights. Others are not as lucky. This man sleeps on the streets near City Hall. He says he was a World War II veteran, wounded in action. I spend more time up in this veterans hospital than you have in this job. My legs are all shot up. My legs are no good. Now I go around bumming drinks. And I have no trouble because the guys told me. A lot of them have been over Vietnam, over in Germany, over in Korea, have fought it for the United States government and laying in gutters and streets. I don't think the Army treated them right. The Army should come back and help these people. But how did the lives of those who were once honored for serving our country turn to this? It happened to me, this man says, because I was never able to recover from what happened 40 years ago in a war halfway around the world. And it's not easy after you've seen all that killing to come back. No, it is not. Yeah. No, it is not. Vernon Shorty Evans is accused of being the hired killer, hired for $9,000 by convicted drug dealer Anthony Grandison to murder two people at the Warren House Motel in Pikesville. The victims, Scott Pahowitz and Susan Kennedy, were killed to allegedly prevent them from testifying against Grandison at his trial as a heroin dealer. They were shot to death in the motel lobby at 3.22 p.m. on April 28th. But Vernon Evans was at this house in Walbrook at 3 p.m. on that date, sitting on the railing at 3102 Windsor Avenue, miles away from the murder scene. At least that's what this witness, Frederick Harvey, testified today. Harvey, an inmate at the Baltimore County Detention Center, occupies the cell next to Evans' cell. But Harvey told the jury he never talked with Evans about his testimony, but that he did talk with Evans the day of the murders on the porch of that house. Harvey says he remembers the day because a girlfriend got a welfare check, and he remembers the time, 3 p.m., because that's when the soap opera, General Hospital, comes on TV, and he was anxious to get home to see part of it. And Evans was in his father's bar on Poplar Gove Street the night before the murders, according to several other witnesses, that he was at the bar and wearing a three-piece suit, which they said was unusual. And that conflicts with prosecution testimony, which had Evans at the Warren House that night. On Monday, Anthony Granderson is expected to begin calling his defense witnesses and may even testify himself. I'm Jack Bowden, New Scene 2 at the Federal Courthouse. As of today, Lexington Market is both the oldest and the newest municipal market in the United States. Construction of the arcade and renovation of existing stores cost $11 million. The new addition boosts the total number of businesses to 160. With all these changes, the mom-and-pop aspect of local business remains intact. Nellie Ruland says the key is simply to keep the customers satisfied. How have things changed in 40 years? Oh, my. When I first come in here, it was like a little shed. And uh, just, it was like a shed. And then we had wagons alongside of the, of the, uh, of the market that come in with uh, country produce. And they sold things right off of, the, off of a, a long board, like from the, from, the, from the market. You'll see it all at the New Lexington Market, from the old and wise to the young and hopeful. The owner of the Italian Stallion is the youngest merchant at this address, and for him, today's opening is a dream come true. Baltimore City is now starting to come alive with all these office buildings coming around, especially the new subway. And uh, Lexington Market has a 200-year tradition, and whenever somebody asks you well, where you open up at, and you say Lexington Market, everybody knows where Lexington Market is. It's just like, it's unbelievable how many people come here, and this is, our heart is in this place right here. It's broad daylight yesterday afternoon when the Lucky Discount store was robbed by two, possibly three teenagers. They took gold chains and they shot the store owner's wife in the chest before running away. Her 10-year-old daughter stood watching and ran for help after the robbery, but 39-year-old Chung Sha So couldn't be saved. We were getting useful information uh, so that the case is moving forward quite actively. We're not at the stage where we can put a name to the suspect or, or anything that close, but we're getting kinds of information 
that lead us to be very hopeful in this case at this particular time. The Lucky Discount store is closed today. The robbery yesterday of the store and the murder of its owner's wife, Chung Sa So, has left a deep impression on the other merchants in the area. The So family was very well liked here. They went to the same church with Kay Kiel, whose store is up the street from the Lucky Discount. Neighboring merchants say the So family was known to give away food and money to the needy. Merchants say they were shocked by the robbery and shooting. I just felt, you know, sorry for, you know, the people, you know, especially the kids, you know, the kids had to be there to watch, you know, the whole thing, you know, that's uh, something other they got to live with the rest of the night of their life, you know, it's, it's not right. There's been so many robberies right here, even the bank right next door to me. Mm -hmm. One early morning, I come in here 8.30, bank got robbed at 9 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And I'm standing here and I'm saying, my God, you know, right next door. Now the lady across the street, right up here, sat, they've all had it right up the street. I've been fortunate so far. I worry so much. I worry so much. Who knows? Next time me, they're going to come and kill me. Who knows? Nobody knows. Somebody has to start something work somewhere and, you know, do something about it. But who's going to do what? Where is it going to start and where is it going to end? Ironically, Chung Cha's husband had been away at the time of the shooting, looking for a new location for the store. He felt the neighborhood was getting too dangerous. Lynn Alexander, News Scene 2, West Baltimore. Two to three dollars, that's what a room here at the Belvedere Hotel rented for 80 years ago when it opened on this date. Rooms now start at $65 a night, but prices aren't all that's changed here at the Belvedere. At that point, we had a very grand, grand hotel. Uh, we had a dining room on the second floor for children only and their governesses. Children were not permitted in the major dining rooms. We had a separate entrance for the ladies. The door just to the left of these revolving doors was only for the ladies. We had a ladies' salon on this floor. Ladies were not permitted in the lobby, and they waited for the gentlemen while they were registering. And we had a ladies' elevator. There was a ladies' elevator went directly up to the rooms or to some of the grand ballrooms. Needless to say, ladies were also banned from the hotel bar, now named for its blinking wooden owls. The names of those who have slept here is impressive. It includes 10 presidents, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, actress Sarah Bernhardt, and many more. The hotel is built on land once part of the John Eager Howard estate. Since that opening day in 1903, the hotel's been through many ups and downs. Hit hard by prohibition and the depression, it went into receivership in 1933. It became part of the Sheraton chain in 1946. In 76, the hotel in Shambles was rescued by this man, its current owner, contractor Victor Frankel. It opened as a deluxe apartment building in 77, but in the spring of 82 converted back to being a hotel. We converted back to hotel for two reasons. Number one, there was a definite need for it in the city of Baltimore. And number two, of course, the economy was very really important. It was economically, you were far better off converting to a hotel. Frankel restored much of the old and added some new features. The view from the 13th floor is one of the prettiest in town. This used to be a mere cloakroom from which guests descended to the 12th floor ballroom. Many, including Mayor Schaefer, feel the hotel has helped to revitalize the Charles Street Corridor. And it looks like the Belvedere's next year's may be among its best. Joyce Jefferson, New Scene 2. The baby was born around 2 this morning, but she wasn't born in the hospital, and whoever had her during her first hour on Earth apparently wanted her dead. She was put in a plastic bag and thrown into this sewer drain at the intersection of Bloom and Division Streets. Two hours later, this young man, Maurice Hill, and some friends were on their way home. Their car stopped at the intersection, and Maurice insisted to his buddies that he heard a child crying over the noise of the car radio and their talking. I couldn't believe that the baby was in the bag because the bag didn't look large enough to hold the baby. But I reached down there and I pulled on the bag, and when I pulled the bag, the baby slipped out the bag. All right, then I seen the baby and I reached back down in there and I pulled the baby on out. And when I pulled the baby up, I see that the cord was still attached and that there was afterbirth hanging from the cord. You know, I just think that's a disgrace, you know, and it, and it didn't happen that way, and whoever did it, could be around somewhere dying itself, you know. I just thought it was a disgrace, and uh, I was just shocked. My cousin took off her coat and uh, opened her coat up, and she wrapped the baby up in the coat. And about five, ten, about a few minutes later, the police had came down, and they took the baby down to the hospital. She came in, she was 
profoundly hypothermic, very cold, and that had slowed down all of her body processes. Um, since that time, she's improved considerably. All her vital signs are stable now. She's rewarmed beautifully and hasn't encountered any of the problems that a baby might encounter while rewarming. Um, right now, she's doing just fine. Police believe the baby was born to someone in the neighborhood because a trail of blood leads from the sewer to a nearby house. Paramedics went to that house an hour and a half before the baby was found. A woman in labor refused treatment. They've questioned a 17-year-old girl who lives there. She insists, despite hospital records to the contrary, that she has not been pregnant recently. The woman is in the hospital and charges are pending. Lynn Alexander, New Scene 2. Pen 